very briefly, I want to share with you in terms of what I've been um, involved in and what I've been engulfed in for about the past month. Open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 37, and really the whole chapter, but, but our discussion centers around the first 11 verses of Genesis, chapter 37. 37th chapter of Genesis. And whether you have it or whether you don't have it, stand as we honor the Word of God. And if you don't have a Bible, hopefully somebody close to you will share that Bible with you or you can just walk down and you can just read along with them. Amen. Genesis chapter 37. And I'm just going to read a couple of the following verses. Jacob lived in the land, and I'm reading from the RSV. Uh, uh, forgive me, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the New International Version, forgive me. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhad and the sons of Zippah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel, and that's Jacob's name that God changed. You remember that the struggle he had at the uh, fork of the Jabbok River? Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. I'm just going to stop right there. And prayerfully and hopefully this will enrich in terms of your knowledge and then it will whet your spiritual appetite that you want to read the whole 37th chapter. And I want to present this as a thought for us to center our attention around because in a way as I was listening to Reverend Thomas, this fits in, I feel, perfectly. Then also with the Michael Brown um, memorial service yesterday and climax in the day. I want to talk about God is still in control. In spite of everything you hear, God is still in control. There have been a lot of critics and a lot of scholars that have tried to um, uh, deny the authenticity of the Old Testament. They have said that the Old Testament has no relevance. But I, I, I want to refute their, their argument. I want to refute in terms of they, from what these scholars say. And I want to, I want to uh, say this loud and clear. The Old Testament is God's voice to his world today. Even though the book is ancient, we cannot discard the message that the Old Testament has because it's an ancient book. For if we did that, then we would have to reject the New Testament as well. Both of God's books, Old Testament, New Testament, is timeless in its application. That's why the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16 and telling him about, in terms of what God had done in his life, asserted dogmatically he said, Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, training in righteousness that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. And in the same context, backing up to verse 13, or 15, forgive me, Paul reminded Timothy that it was the sacred writings which had given Timothy the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 
So it is correct to say that all spiritual lessons derived from passages in the Old Testament do have something to say directly or indirectly about two things about God. And these two, these two thoughts are timeless. They are vital in terms of life truths. The first one is the way to God. The second one is our walk with God. So therefore, the New Testament, the Old Testament, forgive me, is contemporary. Therefore, we must open our hearts to the message for the ground that we stand on now is sacred ground. In the 37th chapter of Genesis, the narrator tells us a very pitiful story. And let me condense it. Is that okay? He starts out by talking about Jacob, or Jacob's name has been changed to Israel. And, uh, and he tells us that Joseph, you, you've heard of Joseph, was born in his old age. But there was a problem, and Jacob should have known better. He favored Joseph over against all of the other boys, Reuben, Simeon, and the rest of them, because there were about nine or ten of them. Jacob should have known better because he encountered the same problem in his home with his mother and father, Rebekah and Isaac. And, and, and that created a gulf between him and Esau in his home with his mother favoring him and his daddy favoring Esau. And it split the family apart. Now he does the exact same thing that his mother and father did. And he knows that that type of atmosphere is not conducive to children growing up and bonding together. So to show that he not only talked about that uh, uh, Joseph was his favorite, he bought, or made him rather, a coat of beautiful colors. And we're told in scripture that this coat was a type of covering that those in higher uh, economic uh, uh, classes of life, that those were the kind of co uh, coats that they wore. These was, this was a coat of distinction. It was loud. It definitely, it pointed up Jacob, over, uh, Joseph rather, over against the rest of his brothers. So Jacob had no bones about favoritism. Now, because he leaned in the direction of, of uh, Joseph, Joseph being a youth, and we know that youth has a lot of folly, it made him somewhat boastful, braggadocious, arrogant, proud, that his daddy favored him and his daddy would listen to him and wouldn't listen to his brothers. So therefore, automatically, it was just like a domino effect. They saw daddy doing for the younger brother what he had never done for them. So therefore, jealousy entered in. Envy, and eventually jealousy and envy are monsters that become what? Hatred, and hatred ensues into what? Murder, killing, trying to annihilate and trying to sniff out the life of a person. It goes on to say that one time, and, and I'm relating this quickly, that Joseph went to his daddy and he, he became a tattletale. He told on his brothers that whatever they had done or whatever they had said, that it was not what Jacob would have been proud of. So there was another reason why they hated Joseph. One day, Jacob said, I want you to go and find your brothers and find out how they are doing. He leaves Hebron. They were supposed to have been in Shechem. When he got to Shechem, 
He didn't see them. Man saw him wandering in the field and he said, who are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. They're supposed to have been there pastoring the sheep, taking care of the flock. He said, oh, they have moved on to Dotham. So he went to Dotham. As he is coming and approaching them, they recognize Joseph from a distance. And the first thing that they say, let's kill him. Let's kill him. We hate him. We're better. We're going to get rid of him. And if we get rid of him, we're going to kill his dreams. Now, we got to back up. Because Joseph had two dreams that he had stuck them with. The first dream he shared with them, he said that they were out in the fields, they were binding grain. And he had his grain to stand up as a sheave, and their grain bowed down to his sheave. And so they said to him, are you saying, with you being the younger, we are older, that we are going to what? Become your slaves? We're going to serve you? Then he had a second dream. He should have kept his mouth shut, but he didn't. Young folk don't know when to stop talking. Amen. The second dream he had, he said, I saw the moon, I saw the sun, and notice he said 11 stars. <laughs> and all of them were gathered around me. And so he told it to his father. So this irritated Jacob. And Jacob said, you mean to tell me we are going to serve you? In other words, who do you think you are? Well, the dreams didn't do anything but just like putting, uh, what, hot sauce, rubbing salt in a wound, making it worse for him. Now, they see him coming. They say, we're going to kill him. So they devise a plan to throw him in a well, and the Bible tells us cistern. Cistern was where water came in, but this cistern, this well was dry. Throw him in a well, and we're going to let him stay there. We're going to let him languish and die. So Reuben, who somehow felt a way of compassion for Joseph, he said, I tell you what, let's do this. Just let him stay there. And let's just leave and think about this, because he was thinking about the narrator said, coming back later on and pulling Joseph out of the well and carrying him back to his daddy. But while he was gone, they decided to sell him to a caravan that was going down to Egypt. And they pulled him up out of the well and they sold him to this Ish, uh, to this Midianite caravan, they carried him down to Egypt. We'll get to that. We'll talk about that later on. Now, when Reuben gets back, he says, where is our brother? He's gone. Now, to show you how hard hard they were and how that hatred had, had uh, overcrossed their souls, after they get through throwing Joseph down in the well, they sat down and started eating their lunch. Now, to me, that's a sign of what? Being what? Indifferent? We don't care. We don't care if he rots down there. Can you imagine? He's in the well, and they are eating lunch. Get the picture in your mind. There's something wrong with that, isn't it? That lets me know they enjoy it what they did. After he sold to the caravan going down to Egypt, what are they going to tell Jacob? What are they going to tell their daddy? So they concoct a lie. They kill a goat. They take that his coat, his favorite coat of many colors, and they soak it in goat's blood. Then they take it to Jacob and they lie and they said that a beast, a wild beast, destroyed and killed your son. Jacob just weeps and weeps. In fact, when I read that, it reminded me of David when Absalom and his son got killed. And when they told David, David just wept and wept uncontrollably. 
and they couldn't console him. Now let's stop right there. This part we want to deal with briefly. What can we glean from this narrative, the first 11 verses? Is there anything positive? I want to suggest three things. First of all, God always acts in conformity to his nature. God always acts in agreement to his nature. What do I mean by that? Somebody asked the question, who is God in the Old Testament? Let me share with you who God is. Not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament. He is an eternal spirit. He is alive and personal. He is the first cause. He is the second cause. He himself is uncaused. He is holy. He's righteous. He's just. He's loving. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's true. He's omnipresent, that the psalmist tells us in Psalm 139, 7 through 12 verses. He's omniscient, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 147, uh, verse 5. He's omnipotent, Job tells us, 42, 2, and Jeremiah 32, 17. And he is immutable, which means he's unchangeable. Malachi tells us that in Malachi 3, 6. All of his attributes are perfect, yet they coexist together perfectly. There is no, there is no confusion in God. Now in us, there is always confusion. Amen? When God sends his judgment for sin, it is because he is a holy God. But then his judgment does not cancel out his grace. Lord have mercy. God never acts contrary to his own nature. Now, some, some, sometimes people ask the question, why does God permit war in the Old Testament? People were destroyed. Thousands of lives were devastated. Well, that's because through our very uh, small, weak, limited human understanding, we cannot understand God. There's no way we do not have that type of insight. But by faith, we must see God as the never-changing one. God is holy, but he always acts in love, and who is loving but never violates his holiness. Does that make sense? So the Old Testament depicts this picture of God. God can chastise. He can destroy, but yet at the same time, he loves. You can understand that. I can understand that. Why? Because in our weak nature, when we are venting anger or bitterness, most of the time, there's no love in that. So then we got to turn that switch off and turn on the switch love, or the love switch. You see what I'm saying? But we can't do both at the same time. Now, I remember one time my mother, she beat me to death with a switch that she had gotten off the rose bush, and she had, uh, you know, taken all the uh, leaves off, and I had whips all on my body across my face, my neck, my ears. And I'm crying and she draws a hot bath of water, puts me in there, and puts some Epsom salts in there, which added insult to injury. And then tells me, I love you. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, if this is the way you love, I sure don't want you to hate me because that show her love was a hurting love. Secondly, all history is in God's sovereign control. Everything in history is in the control of God. There are no accidents in this world. There are no accidents in world history. God directs or he permits the course of events 
in your life and my life personally, and then in the life of a nation. And he, do, he does it because he's sovereign, and in his sovereignty, his will is per perfect, is perfected. Let me give an example. You remember when uh, Israel wanted a king to rule over them? And God didn't want them to have a king, but they told God, we want to be like the other folk. And that reminds me of how some churches today want to be like the world, want to pattern themselves like folk out there, which means that you no longer are an entity. You are no longer what God wants you to be because you cannot be two things at one time. Amen? So God, what did he do? He gave them a king. Saul, but they didn't know what they were getting. And Saul ended up becoming the worst king that could have happened. And then God sent judgment on them because they would not keep him as God and let him lead them. He brought the Babylonian Empire down and carried them into captivity for 70 years because he loved them. <laughs> He let them have what they thought they wanted. But then again, he brought judgment because they made the wrong decision. So, whether you, whether you understand it or not, his grace was, what, wrapped around in his judgment. In both actions, God was sovereign. And in both of his actions, he revealed his nature as well as the nature of man. God is Lord of all of history in whose will even the events fulfill his perfect purposes. Things that happen in my life and your life that don't make sense. Don't think that everything is going haywire and does God know what's going on. Believe me when I tell you, he knows and whether he has permitted it to happen or he is directing, orchestrating it to happen, he's got a reason for allowing that or even directing that event. It's something that he wants to do in your life or my life to bring us to the point down there. Now, to give an example, all of us here are supposed to be Christians, right? A Christian walks on what we call a faith journey. Is that correct? Now, all of us here did not walk, well, our journey, let me say it like this. Our journey has not been the same. Some of our journeys have been rough. God has had to smack us down. He's had to break us and crush us to bring us to where he wanted us to be. Then there are others of us here that the journey has been a milder journey. Look like they ain't been through nothing, you know, and everything has been smooth, but yet God has brought them to his desired purpose. But it doesn't matter in terms of how God works in your life or through your life. It doesn't matter about the journey. The most important thing is that you accomplish the will that he has eternally set for you before the foundation of this world. Let me say it another way. It doesn't matter what you go through. God is right there and he is what? He's guarding you, guiding you. Believe me when I tell you, he will not allow you to be destroyed. Now, you're going to bleed some. You're going to hurt some. But that's for our good. Because all of us got too much trash of the world in us. And just because you are saved, that don't mean that that old nature ain't tapping at your door every now and then. Amen. That flesh is still there. And we war and we struggle with the flesh day in and day out. And if you say that you don't, you're the biggest liar in the world. Or oh, you're not human, you must be a robot. Ain't nobody that holy that they don't have to struggle every now and then with the flesh trying to tell them what to do. Nobody. Let me finish. 
Amen. God was allowing Jacob, Joseph, and his brothers to exercise their freedom of choice, but yet in the shadows, he was what? Exercising his absolute will. Our lives go in different directions, but have, and just reflecting back, have you thought about in terms of where God has brought you from and the people that he's brought into your life and some of those folk, they form lasting relationships, others were just temporary relationships, some of those so-called friends, you can't even remember their names now, you don't know where they're at, whether they're still alive or living or not. And then there are a few that have been there with you through thick and thin, and they've gone through a lot with you, they've cried with you, they've prayed with you, and those are the ones that have strengthened you. Why do you think God brought those folk into your life at exactly the moment you needed somebody? It wasn't an accident but it was a divine, sovereign will of God that he worked it out that way. Let me repeat myself again. There are no accidents in life when it comes to God. God don't deal in accidents. God deals in absolutes. Now, we, we, we are weak in our, in our, in our thinking and, and in our faith. And we think that, well, if I can't see it, it's not real. But don't you know that Scripture validates the point over in Hebrews that the essence of faith is not what we see. Faith is the substance of things that are hoped for and the evidence of things what? Not see. Not we do see, but we don't see. Your faith is carrying you toward God, right? Have any of y'all seen God? Well, somebody will say to you, well, how do you know he exists? And then you might say from an emotional standpoint, well, I know he exists because I can feel him in my heart. Well, everybody has, a fear, has feelings, emotions, right? You got to be more valid. You have to be in terms of more entrenched in your faith. Nothing wrong with saying that. But you got to know, well, somebody said you got to know that you 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 know. You have to be entrenched in your faith that you may not be able to explain it. You may not be able to put it into words. But deep down in the cellar of your soul, you know that God lives in your life that your life has been changed, that there are some things now in your life that used to, uh, the world, all, all the world had to do was just whistle. I mean, I can't even whistle. Something like that. And you would go running. You are, you are attracted by it. You know, you are lured by it like a fish going to bait on a hook. But now, that doesn't feed you anymore, does it? You're not attracted by it anymore. In fact, some of your buddies that used to run with then, they call you up or maybe you might accidentally run into them and they say, hey, I ain't seen you in a long while. How come you don't come around, blah, 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 blah. And you tell them, well, you know, you might make up a story where you've been busy and blah, 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 but in actuality, you don't want to be in that crowd no more. That's the bottom line, you know. Those people, you get no pleasure. You realize that that's not a friendship. That is just an acquaintance. And those folk ain't going nowhere. Finally, redemption is the key subject in this story and in the whole Bible. Redemption. What does the word redemption mean? It comes out of the word what? Redeem, which means what? To buy back which it is implied that is something that originally was mine from the beginning, and then I'm buying it back again. You remember I gave an example last, was it last Sunday, Sunday, whenever it was, about the pawn shop illustration that I gave? You know, you remember that? Okay, now, we, God wants us to be in what? Close, uh, cohesive, 
solidified, unified relationship with him. Amen? Not that distant relationship. Not I'll whistle for you when I need you. But he wants us to walk with him, what? Daily, consistently. And that the more we walk with him, the more, well, I uh, know this is not uh, grammatically correct, but the more hungry we get for wanting to get what? Closer to the Lord. Now, the only way I can get closer to God is that I got to know more about him. And the only place I can find the good news about him is where? I can read books about him, but that's not like knowing him. You remember I talked about that last Sunday. There's a whole lot of folk I know about. I might know more facts about our president than you do, but I've never met him. I don't know him personally. You got to know God personally, nowhere around it. Because he created us, he made us, we belong to him, first cause. Secondly, we made the decision to walk away. We became disobedient. Thirdly, he sends Jesus Christ to die for us and through his redeeming blood to receive us back by faith. So he did all of this to what? To get us back again. Why? Because he loves us. And the scripture says, what? Greater love have no man than this, that a, what? a man, what? Lay down his life for his friend. And we are not friends, but we are his servants. We're his children. And if he would do that for a friend, what would he do for a child that belongs to him? What would he do? How many of you know that you've been born again? Raise your hand. And you have no doubt about it. And it doesn't matter what anybody says. You know it. One last statement. Desiring and hungering for an intimate, personal relationship with Christ is going to present you with all kinds of problems in your life. And the first problem you're going to encounter is in your own family. Because every family has a non-believer. Every family has an atheistic type of attitude person in their family. They're the kind of individuals they know everything. And they're always trying to pragmatically prove that God ain't real. And they will argue until the sun goes down, until the sun rises the next day, until the sun goes down. They'll argue until hell freezes over. And when they get through, then they end up dying going to hell. But it's too late for them to say, oh, I wish I had, if I had known this, I would not have gone that course. You see, it, 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 it's too risky to assume that God doesn't exist. And then when you die, you find out that God is real, and then you go to hell. Too late then, the decision time is now. So isn't it better to assume that God is real and to make a life decision now? To me, that makes sense. And you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that. To me, that's just plain down living. I'd rather be sure than to be guessing. There are some things in life I don't mind guessing about, but when it comes to God, no, no, I don't want to guess about God. I got to know, now this is me personally, I got to know that when I'm going through my pain, my suffering, my problems, my ups and my downs, when I am going through the furnaces of life, I got to know, me, Barna, that God is real, that he's right there by my side. I don't understand all of the stuff I'm going through. Sometimes say will come 
to me and say, now look at all of the sacrifices you've made in your life. Look at all the service you've given to him. Look at all the sermons you've preached. And he treats you like this? Well, yeah, mama treated me like that. And she claimed that she loved me, Brother Holmes, but she beat me to death. But you know what? Just before Mama closed her eyes, do you know I love that woman more than my own life? And you know why? Because now, looking back, I understand why. Because there was a lot of junk in me that Mama was trying to beat out. Even though she didn't beat all of it out, the Lord had to knock some more out of me. But thank God that Mama initiated the process. And one thing that I loved her for, she never stopped telling me about Jesus Christ. And Mama just didn't talk about the Lord, but Mama lived Christ. And you see, that, that, that helped to turn me. That helped to persuade me. Sister Briggs, you got your, is the keyboard is here, and the guitarist here, anybody to beat the drums here? Okay, can y'all come and take your respective positions? Uh, and as you know, you, you've come up in a black Baptist church. So you know the tradition. Can you give us a song, like an invitation? Because somebody here needs to come to Christ. So you choose it as the Holy Spirit directs you. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. I know you got lost and everything, but at least you made it on the end. So that's the most important thing. Amen.